Good evening and welcome to Creative Brain Week. Um, I'd like to introduce Professor Brian Lawlum and Professor Ian Robertson. Good start. Thanks, Dominic, for, for remembering us. Just hello, everybody, and just welcome to Creative Brain Week. As Dominic said, my name is Brian Lawler. I'm site director for the Global Brain Health Institute here at Trinity College Dublin and professor of old age psychiatry. So I really want to give you the warmest possible welcome to Creative Brain Week. And as I came into the building, a number of people said to me, welcome back. So welcome back to so many of you. So many of you are such great friends of Creative Brain Week. I particularly want to welcome our friends from the Atlantic Institute, our fellows from the Global Brain Health Institute, and our friends from Jamil Arts and Health Lab, the Lancet Writing Group. You're all very, very welcome. So this year's themes are attention, connection, and love, and of course, everything in between. So this is our third year of Creative Brain Week, and we are growing, and this year we're going global with our satellites, but I'll tell you more about that later. So a number of years ago, we started to think about Creative Brain Week because of the importance of creativity for our lives. Creativity happens in the brain, which is our most important asset. And creativity helps generate solutions. It's characterized by curiosity and openness. And it can help us imagine a better future for ourselves. And at times like this in the world that we live in, we need Creative Brain Week to imagine what a better future might look like. So Creative Brain Week is a wonderful opportunity to instill positive feelings about anticipated outcomes. It's time to shift our thinking away from differences and exclusion to one of hope, inclusion, and the possibility of solutions. So it's a time for us to connect in person and online to engage our brains and its creativity as you hear and see the happenings as they unfold before you during the week. Now, Dominic Campbell, our creative producer extraordinaire, has asked me to reflect back a little bit on some of the standouts for me last year, but also to think ahead of what, what am I anticipating, what am I excited about happening uh, in the coming week. So if you remember, last year's themes were about conflict, imagination, and joy. And for me, the session on conflict in Northern Ireland and hearing about the impact of the conflict on the mental health of generations was one of the standouts. And given the impact and collective, uh, and collective trauma of the troubles, it's really amazing to see that a peace process actually was achieved 25 years ago. And it really demonstrates how with imagination and creativity, differences can be bridged and forgiveness achieved. Now the second standout session for me was under the theme of joy. And I'm sure if many of you who are here last year will remember the session led by people with Down syndrome who celebrated their success, their talents, and their abilities in an unforgettable way. It was just an amazing experience, truly joyous. Now looking forward to this week, it's packed full of so many exciting offerings that I'm sure we're all gonna miss out on a few. But I'm very excited about two uh, happenings. One is the technology story, storytelling connection and brain health session on Wednesday morning. I'm particularly interested in hearing about the journey of Eleanor Baez's creative cartoons for brain health for children. This is my brain, Robbie, and it's great to see Eleanor here. Um, they've traveled from Paris to Argentina, and believe it or not, back to Dublin. Um, some of the local uh, kids in the schools here in Dublin I think, have been exposed to my brain, Robbie, and I think we're going to hear about this interesting journey about children's brain health. I'm really excited about that because I think it's so important for our future to protect and promote our children's brain health. My second anticipated highlight is on Thursday morning, and it's themed under love, 
or as Dominic would say, when love is not enough. And this is where we're looking at our individual experience of love manifested as care and caring and the challenges of love and the action of care where we try to deliver it at scale. And as part of a response to the presentations from a neuroscientist, an artist, and a public health specialist, we'd have a creative conversation with John Farley, the CEO of the Mental Health Commission, and Siobhan Cardle, the Assistant Secretary from Social Care and Mental Health at the Department of Health here in Ireland. And they're going to be looking at how we can join together fragmented care systems in a more holistic way. Now, I'd mentioned previously that we're going global, and now we have four satellites all over the world supported by the Atlantic Institute. We have one in Botswana, one in Cairo, one in Brisbane, and one in Delhi, all led by our Atlantic fellows. Actually, the satellite in Cairo happened today. It's contemporaneous. It's happening at the same time as Creative Brain Week here in Dublin. And I, just a shout out to Mohammed Salama if he's there because he's leading on that. And in fact, I was joining him this morning at nine o'clock to help kick off the session. And I know it's going uh, beautifully over there. So congratulations, Mohammed, on a wonderful satellite. <laughs> These satellites are an extraordinarily exciting development and I hope that we can continue to grow them in the years ahead. Now finally, and back to today, we have the Pratchett Prize announcement at 6 p.m. or thereabouts. Now, this prize acknowledges the contribution of a scientist, an artist, an activist, or a person living with dementia who've made a significant contribution to change the narrative around dementia. Now, many of you will know that Terry Pratchett was an extraordinary writer, but more importantly, he was an extraordinary human being. And this is the inaugural award in memory of Terry, who was connected to Trinity in so many different ways. But I think you'll hear more about that later on. So I'd advise you to buckle up this week. It's going to be a creative roller coaster that I hope will change your brains for good. Now I'll hand over to my colleague and friend, Ian. Thank you very much, Brian. And I really, uh, a big shout out to all the people online. Apparently we're sold out online, which is amazing. I didn't know that could happen <laughs> or had to happen. And we have this wonderful audience here. And as Brian said, how great to be back. Now, can I just ask a question of you all? How many of you have been um, more than a, a couple of times in the last year at a live event of theater or music or, can you put up your hands? Yeah, not surprising, almost everyone's putting up their hand. Um, well, uh, Daisy Fancourt's a fantastic researcher at UCL in London um, on the arts and, and, and health and the brain. And um, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging uh, did us, looked at that question, how many asking, to what extent have you been a participant, participant in the arts as an audience member? Uh, more than a few, few times or more per year. And the people who answered yes to that question were, over the next 14 years, were 31% less likely to die. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, the scientists among you will say, aha, the correlation, of course, um, doesn't demonstrate cause, and they're absolutely right. It doesn't demonstrate cause. However, in these big longitudinal studies, you can statistically control for as many variables as possible that might be these potential guilty contaminants that are the real causes. And this was in spite of parceling out for social class, um, uh, health, and all sorts of other things. So let's take it as a plausible hypothesis that um, being part, participating in the arts, even as an audience member, um, might lengthen your life. How might that happen? And, and there's a number of uh, very great advances in, in neuroscience over the last year, in fact, suggesting that no, the importance of novelty. You no, know, participating in the arts exposes you to novelty. And um, 
Uh, we now, a very recent study from France, in fact, from Lyon, showing that novelty actually, exposure to no novelty in mice actually changes the structure of the locus ceruleus, the, a critical part of the brain for generating incredibly important brain protecting uh, neurochemicals. So it was the first evidence that at this critical node, which is at the heart of our response to novelty, um, can be affected by, uh, by novelty. Um, curiosity is of course the, the father or mother of novelty. Curious people experience novelty in an environment which to other people is unchanging and boring. So uh, curiosity is an antidote to boredom. And if you're not bored, you're stimulated and exposed to novelty. That is extremely good for your brain. And if your brain is kept alive and reasonably healthy in spite of other diseases, there's a reasonable hypothesis you'll be less likely to die. Thirdly is engagement. Um, if you're part of an audience in a concert or a theater, you're, you're actually a participant in a live performance. You are a participant. There's evidence that the, 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 the brain response to live music, for example, is quite different than the brain response to, to um, uh, recorded music. And, that's, uh, and the, we, we can see in, in, perfor in performances synchrony occurring in the brain waves and the brain responses of both performers and audience. So you're an active participant, and that means you're engaged. And engagement activates all sorts of nurturing uh, neurochemicals in the brain. And finally, there's purpose. Uh, a sense of purpose is, is as good for you in terms of your longevity as not smoking. <laughs> Lack of purpose is, 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 is in some ways worse than smoking for your, for your health if you want to live a healthy, long life. So uh, we're, we're here at a time when there's this, at a, I think, an inflection point, thanks in great measure to incredible leaders like Dominic Campbell and Brian Lawler, who have you know, been absolutely instrumental in putting this amazing set of events together. And this, this is not just about enjoying ourselves, this is about life and death. And it really is uh, fantastic this week, as Brian was saying, particularly to see some really our world's leading neuroscientists applying themselves to the themes of attention, connection, and love. So thank you all very much, and welcome to the event. Okay, so I'm Dominic. I am your MC, or if you're from Pantoland, Buttons, for the next few days. Uh, I drop in and drop out. Um, and this evening is all about welcomes and who's in the room and hellos. It's all about what have people been doing since last year to this year. So I want to start with the, the three recipes that make up Creative Brain Week. So the first one is obvious, nothing about us without us. It speaks for itself. The second one is no show without a tell, no tell without a show. And I think we made that up ourselves. And we made it up because we recognize that these people that gather in this room and those people that gather online come with very different intelligence and expertise. They come with very different skills and knowledge and learning, lived or learnt or however they come by it. And so we wanted to recognize that there are different ways that we make knowledge. And so our whole program is built around that. Every day you will get a presentation like this. You will get the chance to go to Living Labs, of which more later. You will get the chance to listen to conversation and engage. And then the third one is each one teach one. The idea that you come here when we could join online or we could phone, we could do digital and connection. But you come here because proximity matters. Being in the presence of other people, it really still matters. Ideas are based in places. They grow from places. And so tonight is partly about what ideas are growing from this place and these people and this conversation. And so I'm going to start out, hopefully, by taking us out of the room, by taking us to Cairo with a bit of luck. I have to say, this is not television. There are three people up there with wires and bits of string tying this together. And, uh, but we have, as Ian was saying, begun these projects, these satellites. And I thought a great place to start would be by 
if we can, checking in with them and inviting them into conversation. Hey, it works. Woo! So I'd like to welcome into Dublin virtually Mohammed Salama from the American University in Cairo. Hello. Hello. Hi, Dominic. Hi, and, everyone. And Lingani from Botswana, who leads the uh, Crater Brain Week satellite in Botswana, who I think might be in Cairo. Are you both in Cairo? Lingadi, are you in Cairo? No, I'm still in Johannesburg, Dominic. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> we, have a, we have an audience that moves quite a lot. So today, Mohammed uh, got in a few hours early. He managed to start uh, the Creative Brain Week in Cairo a little bit earlier. And we've been talking about what these might be. Creative Brain Week satellites, we talk of as being thematically connected but locally informed. Why could we take an idea that develops in the particular context of Dublin and just land it in somewhere else. It doesn't work like that. How can you grow it from place? And so what I'm going to do for the next 10, 15 minutes is have a conversation with, with both of you about uh, what is unique about how you're growing Creative Brain Week where you are. And uh, Mohammed, if it's okay, I'll start with you because you're a little bit ahead. Uh, so how was your first day in Cairo? It was amazing. So um, at first, it was amazing in terms of the number of attendees and the audience, the diversity and the structure of the audience as well. We had high school students alongside the university students, publics, and even we have a group of uh, seniors who were attending to know more about brain facts and brain health. It was uh, also amazing in terms of diversity of the program. As you know, we have different and parallel sessions. So some of the sessions are pure science, others are fun, music and, and, and arts. And honestly speaking, many of those who were considered hardcore scientists and were booking uh, or, or, or signing up for science sessions, switched and went to do drums and music and experienced novel uh, feelings when they are doing music for sake of brain health. So I, I, I am a bit, of course, intrigued by the diversity and different activities. But what I can see is that we are happy. Everyone had fun so far. Hopefully this will continue until the end of the week. So tell us about the next two or three days. What's going to happen over the next few days? So tomorrow we'll have uh, somehow what we call Science Day. We are dedicating one whole day for complex problem. And for by complex problem, we mean complex brain disease. We're talking about Parkinson's disease. We have experts in the area of Parkinson's disease. Alongside uh, art therapists who are working on uh, movements order uh, art therapy. Also, we have some uh, uh, artistic activities in parallel. Uh, run uh, in parallel to the scientific uh, lectures. The third day is uh, mainly the creativity day or the art day. It's full of uh, lectures, arguments, and discussions about the value of art and the creativity in brain health. We have several interesting uh, parallel uh, sessions, one about AI and brain health, one about philosophy and medicine, What about one about the burnout of uh, healthcare practitioners. And finally, on Thursday, we have this policy day. Hopefully, we, we by reaching Thursday, we will be able to convince policymakers and decision makers that brain health matters and that the approach to tackle brain or address brain health problems is diverse and multidisciplinary. It's not only about science or neuroscientists, but also about music, about creativity, about lectures and education, about everything. Everything matters and everyone can play a role. And finally, we have a gathering for the whole uh, Creative Brain Week at audience attendees and speakers on Friday for an informal uh, gala dinner and discussions and art show. So that's it. <laughs> and hopefully we have Lingani with us tomorrow. <laughs> we hope so. So Lingani, I'm going to come to you. Lingani Mbakli Maladza, you're based in Botswana. You work in the University of Botswana. You work as a psychiatrist, both lecturing and also seeing patients. And in Botswana, what what has been the what's been the ambition for you with running a creative brain week? What do you hope to achieve? Yeah, so um, just a bit of a correction. I work as a psychologist, not a psychiatrist. Second so with 
So with Creative Brain Week, what we're, we, we've actually developed this with the Department of Psychology at the University of Botswana. So our aspiration is really to use Creative Brain Week as a mechanic or as a mechanism to raise awareness about um, brain health to educate people, to talk about brain health as well as mental health. And uh, one thing is that we want to make sure that we do this in ways that are relevant to the people of Botswana. So educate them in ways that are relevant to them. And then think about, um, you know, driving this awareness, driving this education in ways that are gonna be sustainable as well. Um, so just a little bit about uh, our satellite site. We've developed Creative Brain Week in, in three main phases. So we were done with the first phase. So basically the first phase was about bringing a group of people together from different backgrounds to really talk about what does creative, I mean, what does brain health mean in the Botswana contest? When we talk about brain health, what do we mean? And then how do we actually share information about brain health? Um, so we sort of discussed what brain health means, uh, what messages we need to share. And then the next stage after that is actually um, training a group of students. As I said, we developed this in partnership with the psychology department. So training a group of psychology students who are our brain health ambassadors. So training them how to basically go out into communities and um, spread the messages basically to talk about uh, brain health, to talk about mental health. So that was the first stage. Um, the next exciting stage, which is gonna come in May, is we're actually going to now go out into the wider communities in Botswana. Um, the first thing that we'll do is we will visit a kotla. So a kotla is like a, um, it's like a village court. So each, uh, each village has a chief, and the chief has a village court. This is where people will normally gather. For example, if there's important messages to relate to people, or you know there needs to be disciplinary action or anything like that, that normally happens at a kotla. So it's kind of like a sacred place where people go there to, to listen to messages, if you like. So we will visit a kotla in a village called Ramotswa, which is a rural area of Botswana. And our ambassadors from the university will spread messages about brain health. So we're looking forward to that. And then we will also visit a couple of schools. Um, we really wanted to think about brain health in, in more of a spectrum, you know, thinking about, you know, what it means to younger people, to children, to the youth, also to older people as well. Um, so we'll visit schools. It's a primary school, which is also in a village called Ramapadle. So um, our ambassadors will go out there, raise awareness as well in schools. And then the third community outreach that we will do is we will do a, a walk, like an awareness walk. So we'll, we've organized a 10 kilometer awareness walk, which actually moves from the city, but more into like a high density area out of Khaboroni. And, you know, in the same vein, we'll be spreading messages about brain health. And this will all come together on the 8th of May in... Um, you know, a celebration, if you like. So we'll bring together community, we'll bring together educators, and then we'll have a celebration and symposium at the University of Botswana at the auditorium there. So in a nutshell, that's what we're looking at for Creative Brain Week in Botswana. We love the way that you've taken it and undone it and put it back together in a way that makes sense in Gaborone and in Botswana. It's just gorgeous. And we're very much mm -hmm. looking forward to following the story as best we can. Um, what has been surprising for you? What's been interesting as you've as you've stepped into making a creative brain week? Yes. Yeah, so the first phase is what we've already done. So as we came together, as I said, in the first phase, we came together as a group of people, if you like, to talk about, you know, what we want to share with people and, you know, what it actually means, what brain health means. Um, you know, you know, we know there's things such as um Sorry, I just got put up your camera. It's okay. Can you still hear me? Yeah, we can still hear you. We can still see you. Okay. Sorry. I just thought I checked out for a minute. So, um, 
for example, we know that exercise is something that, you know, we quite often hear as something that is good for the brain. And this is something that we were discussing in the in the group, like, okay, how do we actually, you know, spread the message about, you know, needing to exercise for your brain health? And one thing that came up for us is that we actually don't need to be telling people to be exercising. We need to be celebrating that they are exercising because you'll find that in the Botswana community, people do a lot of exercise in different forms, not necessarily going to the gym, but you'll find that people walk for miles or kilometers and kilometers. For example, people will walk for kilometers going to, to schools or going to work or going to the fields. And people do quite a lot of exercise where people, especially in rural areas, where people still work in farms, st people still produce their own food. Um, so instead of saying, oh, we need to exercise, it's more about highlighting the great things that they're doing when they're exercising, for example. And we found this with all the satellites. We found how do we take some things that people take for, for granted or they use casual language. So the other one might be the Mediterranean diet. How's the Mediterranean mm -hmm. diet going to adapt? <laughs> well, it doesn't exist over here. Uh, we, we do have a, you know, being a, a, a low to middle income country, there is quite, you know, certain areas have food insecurity. Yeah. So it's difficult to say to people, oh, go ahead and have a Mediterranean diet because people do struggle to, to find food, for example. Um, so the way we've decided to, to put that message across is, okay, take it a step back. Instead of saying to people, you need to have a Mediterranean diet, it's more about, okay, how do we ensure that we have good nutritious food? For example, can we start thinking about our backyard gardens where we grow our own fruits and vegetables, which will be good for your brain health? So taking it a step back and saying, um, let's, let's look at ways in which we can produce our food. You know, what part of your yard do you think you can carve out to make sure that you have a backyard garden so you can grow your spinach, you can grow your carrots, your beetroot, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And in both places, the arts mm -hmm. and creativity, they mean different things. They work in different ways, but they're beginning to weave through the, all the content of, of everything, really. So in the, in the, in the celebration piece, what's going to happen in the celebration piece? Sure. So in the celebration piece, we're going to, because you'll remember that I said we'd be out in communities for the other bits. So this is now we come back to the university. So we will bring the community. So this is one way of the university actually reaching out to communities and, you know, the university not being an ivory tower that people cannot access. So people from the community will be able to come into the university. We will have um, scientists talking about brain health. We would have artists talking about brain health. For example, in our program, we have um, a neurologist talking, we have a psychologist, we have a public health specialist, we have a music therapist, we have a dancer, um, we have a choir because music is actually something that's um, ingrained within the Botswana culture. Um, you know, a lot of our celebration or when we're happy and when we're sad, we, you know, we express ourselves through music as a lot. So um, there'll be a choir, there'll be a vocalist who just comes on their own to sing and spread messages about brain health and music. So uh, we might bring Mohammed back in if we can. No, and uh, so I wish you the best of luck Lingani, over the next, um, where are we? March, April, May? Over the next month. We will be talking a lot. Yeah. I'm just doing this for the performative piece. Uh, we, we talk every week. <laughs> but uh, and yeah. I, wish you, I wish you really good luck in the rest of your travels through to Cairo. So good luck with the rest of the journey. Thank you very much for joining us in Creative Brain Week. Thank you so you. much. Thank you for having me. So, um, What's, what's your energy levels like? Can you give me a visual cue? Are you there or there? There. Oh, we're up there. That's quite good. Okay. Can you, can you do that? Yeah. And then can you turn to the person to the left and to the person to the right? That's good. That's no. Okay. Now that you've been introduced already, uh, would you like to say hello to whoever you're sitting by that you don't know? Tonight is all about hellos. Who is there that you don't know? You might introduce yourself. And online, same thing. <laughs>